All right, guys, you have Holly Haven and Andy Haven here with the Haven Home Team. And there's a lot been going on with one bank collapse after another, right? We just keep hearing about it in the news for the last seven days or so. And as much as I wish I knew all the things about all the things, I don't. I'd like to call in my professionals and today we have marcel dietrich with guaranteed rate with us marcel welcome thank you thank you thanks for joining us just wanted to pick your brain a little bit because i can see what's happening in the moment right we saw interest rates actually drop a little bit this week for the first time in a while due to the bank collapse and what's happening Absolutely. across the board so Absolutely. yeah tell us a little bit about maybe why we're seeing that interest rate decrease and then what we can expect, you know, maybe over the next few months even. We have to kind of have a clear understanding of what happened because that's going to help us make a decision as to whether or not we should go ahead and act now and not act now, see exactly where we are in the process. What is happening now is certainly still something that uh, that is currently being addressed, needs to be addressed, but it is not that banks actually went out and were doing all sorts of crazy loan types. We kind of have to rewind to about 2020, really at the beginning of COVID when it started. Well, when COVID started, the government really started uh, pumping out money through the U.S. Treasury. Lots and lots of money. So what happened to this point is a lot of these businesses received this money, but they weren't actually in business. Their doors weren't open. So what ended up happening is these businesses had this money and they started putting all that money into the banks. Now, how do banks typically earn money? Well, they lend money out at a higher interest rate. Well, if you recall, if businesses are not opening up, everything that was happening during 2020 and 2021, there really wasn't a need for a lot of people to go out and take loans and start new businesses because the government had everyone shut down. So what did the banks do? They said, okay, well, right now, if we're sitting here on all this money and we're losing money, we have to do something safe with it. So one of the safest things theoretically to do is put that into bonds. Now, these bonds didn't necessarily make a lot of money because they're considered hyper secure investments, but they were paying roughly about, let's say, 2%. So if you're a bank and you take in money, $100,000, and half a percent is what you have to pay back out to that business on interest for getting that money in, and then now you can take that money and put it in a bonds and earn, let's say, 2% on that, well, in essence, you're making $1,500. So now fast forward as we basically get into 2020, 2021, 2022, and now 2023, all of a sudden, obviously, everything has changed. The Fed has increased the Fed funds rate at the fastest rate than we've ever seen in history. So what that means is as the Fed funds rate goes up, so does the amount of interest which is being paid on bonds. So if I go now and try to go buy bonds, I'm not going to be looking at being paid out, let's say, 2% like we were back in 2020. I'm probably going to be looking at 4%, 5%, or 6%. The other thing about bonds is when it comes to mark-to-market -to -mark accounting, you do not actually have to change the value of those bonds as a banking institution on your books until you sell it. So all this money was basically tied up in these bonds. So what happened now in 2023, all of these businesses obviously have started back up and a lot of them are not being that profitable. So what ended up happening here in 2022 and 2023 is obviously the economy started going back up. Businesses were kind of going from being locked down completely to now going back into the business cycle. That means that they were taking their money out. And a lot of them, especially when you're talking about some of the IT firms that are out there, they were running at a negative. So now they're taking more and more money that they had deposited with banks out of the bank. Well, banks have to maintain a certain amount of liquidity. And depending on the banking institution, it's roughly about 10%. But now when those businesses come along and they're actually wanting to take their money out, hopefully they have enough assets in the account Otherwise, what they have to do is they have to start liquidating. That means selling some of those bonds. When they do sell those bonds, all of a sudden, that on paper loss becomes reality. And so all of a sudden, liquidity really became an issue because all of these businesses are actually taking their money out of these banking institutions. Now, what the government did at that point is they basically said, okay, the FDIC limit is $250,000 per account that's in that banking institution. However, especially in the uh, Silicon Valley Bank, 
there were a lot of people who and businesses who had significantly more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in there. So the government actually came in and did a backstop saying that we're willing to secure any of that and take all of those losses. Now, that obviously saved some of the businesses and some of the people that had money invested, but it actually caused a domino effect, which could potentially end up causing lots of problems in the future. So what are some of those problems? Well, the question is now, if you're willing to do that for one institution, should you also be willing to do that for all institutions? Because the Silicon Valley Bank isn't the only bank that during 2020 and 2021 had all of these inflows because the U.S. Treasury was literally printing money faster than uh, anyone had ever seen. It was an enormous amount of money. And so a lot of these institutions went with the same way of conservative thinking and putting that money into those bonds. And then all of a sudden, everything completely got turned on its head when the Fed started increasing the interest rate. So right now, the big concern is how many other banks out there are in a position to where they have a lot of money that is tied up in these bonds that are paying much lesser interest rates than currently uh, is out there. And also, what the government has done is they've actually came in and said, OK, well, if you're underwater on these bonds, you can actually go directly to the government and swap that out. Uh, in essence, they're saying that it's not going to cost uh, individuals or taxpayers any money. But at the end of the day, money doesn't just automatically appear. It always ends up getting passed on to uh, the consumers. So the question is now, what is going to happen this week? So this week, there's another Fed meeting. And we have two big problems that are currently going on. Number one is obviously the inflation issue. The way that the Fed curbs inflation is by increasing that Fed funds rate. But in turn, by doing that, now all of a sudden, they're taking the interest rates on all of those bonds and other products and driving them higher, meaning that the banks that are holding all of those older bonds from 2020 and 2021 are even more upside down on that. So right now, it's pretty much a catch-22 for the Fed. Do they raise interest rates? Do they not raise interest rates? Or do they pause? It's a really, really tricky question. A lot of people aren't sure exactly which way it's going to go, which, again, causes insecurity in the market. And when the market's not really secure as to what specifically is going on, that's when interest rates start to uh, really drop down a little bit. It really is a complex situation, and you have to understand a little bit about what's going on because the, the silver lining, again, is that interest rates are coming down, and most people actually freeze. That is not generally the best thing to do. And right now, people that are trying to take advantage of lower market interest rates certainly have an opportunity that's out there. Okay, that's super interesting. Yeah, I was kind of wondering because we are in the middle of this uncertainty and stability and we're watching it drop, you know, I'm I'm just wondering, are we going to see that drop maybe continue over the next couple of months? So right now, there's certainly a lot of volatility. One of the big dates that's often talked about is May 10th. And the reason for that is because when we're looking at inflationary numbers, basically, that's a year over year number. So when we go back to May 10th, 2022, and that number ends up dropping off, and now we're at a new 12-month window, basically, through May of 2023, we're going to see a big drop in inflation. Because because the inflation was really at a peak back in those 2022 numbers on May. Yeah, no, that's really interesting because, you know, what we're hearing and seeing from, from clients or, or leads, people who are like, maybe I want to buy, but, you know, I'm a little bit nervous right now. But we're just seeing a lot of really interesting things in the market. We had some unrealized gains that were happening very quickly. So we had the supply and the demand issue. So we had buyers offering 100000 over list price. Now those values have caught up with the appraisals. Now mm -hmm. it's a new market value. And even now we're starting to fill 20,000 over list price, you know? So we're just continuing to, to move that mark as we go. And now with the interest rates just dropped this week, that's when people start flooding to the market. So I think we're even going to be more competitive that we've already felt the last few weeks. It is. And with the inventory levels, that's really one of the things that concerns me a little bit because you have so many people that did take advantage of buying during that 2020, 2020, 
uh, one year to where their interest rates on their homes right now are in their two or threes. And so they're not super motivated to actually sell their house. You also have a lot of builders who've transitioned from single, single family homes to now working more commercial projects. All of that shift, the inventory numbers, uh, they're definitely something to be aware of as a buyer because it may not be like you said to where everyone is scared out there. You're just going to be able to offer $20,000 below list and boom, they're going to accept it. That That's not how it's going to work because of that supply and demand issue that's currently going on. A great example right now is we have one listed. We expect to have multiple offers on it. It's been on the market a whole two and a half days. And, and we're already expecting to see some really strong offers on this one. But they're selling and using this equity and they're paying cash for the next house. They have yeah. no intentions of getting this new interest rate. So for us, once everything dropped and got crazy, you know, that really happened after 9-11, we felt mm -hmm. all those interest rates shift and they never really came fully back. We've kind of fluctuated between three and five. It really has. And the thing is, when you have a steady interest rate environment, that is good because people can make decisions in that if they know what things are going to be, if interest rates are stable. But when you have interest rates that are jumping up above seven and now they're down at five and now they're back up at seven, it certainly can yield a, a little bit of uh, skepticism as to what's going on with the market. Yeah. And something else I feel like, you know, we, we get a lot of the, a lot of the questions or the thoughts or the theories, right. That buyers come up with, I don't know if they're seeing some crazy headline or if they've just decided on their own, you know, it's these house prices are going to drop. So if you're always waiting for that next best opportunity, you might miss the best opportunity that was sitting right in front of you because you were really hoping for something better. There's a lot of opportunity here for, for buyers and sellers across the board, really. And I mean, if you're in the right place to, or need to make that move or kind of have to make a decision, but if you're, if you're young and you want to, you know, build wealth, Real estate is the fastest way. You know, same for us. It's not the same property. It's not the right property for every buyer. So it's really important for us to kind of go through that education process with them, answer these questions, help them understand what is happening so that they have a little bit of gut feeling about making that purchase. Absolutely. But, but getting into that first home, it really does give you options. Because at that point, like, like Andy, after you're done with your townhome, you'll have the option. You can either sell it and walk away with the equity, or you can rent it out and now have an income producing property. Yeah. And I think my generation, it helped a lot seeing all of the appreciation through COVID because I think it really made people realize like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be spending $3,000 a month on an apartment mm -hmm. when I can go buy a house. Maybe it's something you have to fix up, but you're only paying say $2,400 a month on your mortgage and you're updating that and you get appreciation. And I also, I know this is ridiculous, but a lot of people on TikTok are starting to actually inform younger generations of how to flip and how to make money and how real yeah. estate is the fastest way to make money. So I think a lot of people my age and younger are going to be buying homes sooner than other generations, in my opinion. I think it's a very, very smart move because it's one of the things that people generally aren't taught in schools is how to basically leverage that, the value of that asset in order to gain that appreciation. And I think that view is actually very, very positive because it is going to help you create wealth faster than some of the uh, previous generations. Yeah. yeah. Well, Marcel, thank you so much for your time today. I super appreciate you jumping on here and explaining some of the things to us. Like I said, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. So I like to bring in professionals on the stuff I don't know. So we appreciate your time and your help. And um, yeah, if anybody is watching this video and you just have questions about what does it look like to get approved, it's not scary, guys. It might be a little uncomfortable for a second, but reach out to Marcel. Him and his, you know, his team can definitely help you out. Um, and get you some answers so that you feel educated about the process and not just out here wondering, you know, what to expect. Absolutely. Well, thank you all mm -hmm. so much. Uh, Y'all have a great day and uh, we'll certainly be in touch. All right. Bye, guys. <laughs>